Hi and welcome to our first session of digital technology and social change. Let's talk about in this first session how we can think digitally. How can we have some frameworks for, for keeping up with our ever evolving digital reality? You know, way too often when I work, be it with, with companies, with the CAOs of companies or with governments, presidents, secretaries, or, or any civil servants, NGOs, or also universities, you always, you often get the feeling that our, our mindset is really not yet thinking digitally. It, it's not thinking in the digital paradigm. We are still basically in the last millennia or last century, where, where things were pretty much the same. You know, the industrial giants gave us employment. Banks were the owners of everything. And we were fighting wars over natural resources, basically. But last time I checked, uh, the, the dominating companies of this world, of the most valuable companies of the history of humankind, all auto-classified themselves as artificial intelligence companies. Now, you might say, okay, you know what, that is just, that's basically just because of the pandemic. And during the pandemic, we had to do more online stuff. And then, you know, they filled their pockets. But if I look back, that's not like that has been around before the pandemic. And, and, and not a lot has changed. And this is now going on for quite some time. Well, two of them seem to ch switch places regularly, depending on which CAO messes up in the last Congress hearing, it seems. <laughs> but besides that, not a lot has changed. So we really need to now move forward and accept that this world is dominated by the digital paradigm. You know, more than 70%, some 80, 90% in some markets of our resource distribution on the stock market is handled by artificial intelligence. 99 point something percent of our energy distribution decisions on the electric grid is done by artificial intelligence. This information process that just couldn't, you know, you cannot store energy really, like that goes way too fast for us to flip the switch manually. And in the United States, uh, some statistics say that over 50% of marriages, which later then go on and have children start because an intelligent recommender algorithm said, hey, you two actually should meet, you, you, you are a great match. Now, if you would tell me that, listen, we found an extraterrestrial species and 80% of the resource distribution, 99% of the energy distribution and 50% of the procreation decisions is made by this system, call it AI, then I would say like, hey, wait, no, this like this system is part of that species, you know that you know the, the chip in the brain might come, but but we don't really need it on on the level of society, we already merged with artificial intelligence with advanced digital technology beyond any point of return. Sure, you could go in the mountains and you could, or you could go in the desert and you can get rid of your phone and never ever interact with any money because in the back office, it's all digital. And you will, if you're good, you will survive for, for, for several years and, and you're still human. But under no circumstance can you argue that you're co-evolving with the rest of our society. Our society, is an emergent phenomena evolving together with artificial intelligence already. Now, in this exploration of the digital paradigm, we take well, an academic approach, a structured approach uh, from innovation theory, because it doesn't really, it, it doesn't matter which technology it is, but we can learn from previous technological revolutions. And by understanding the nature of technological revolutions, it can help us to guide, navigate the currently dominating technological paradigm, which is 
digital technology. The digital paradigm created was so fast and created such riches that it's it's actually it's mind boggling to think about it. So if we take uh, the top ten digital individuals, which are mainly white men, maybe with one or two uh, exceptions, uh, and take their net worth. Um, uh, most recently, let's say, like it's, uh, say together they have like a trillion dollars. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good party. And compare it with the world economies, sovereign nations. It turns out um, that only ninety two percent, seventeen countries out of almost two hundred seventeen, two hundred sixteen economies in the world are larger than if these ten men would gather in a room and put their money together, like what they have on their bank account. Like these men, it's like what they have on their bank account. And this year is the entire economy, like everything that flows through the economy. It's the GDP. And there are only 17 out of the 216 economies in the world that have a larger economy that want these, what these guys have on their bank account. I can also look at it the other way, that the bottom half of the world's sovereign nations, supposedly sovereign nations, together have a GDP, economic power, that's less than what these 10 digital entrepreneurs uh, created and, and put away on their bank account. So it, it is a paradigm that created unprecedented riches and an unprecedented power. I mean, if you uh, as a person have such a power that is, that's a lot, that's a lot of power that, that you can have with, with so much, not only the economic power, they also have the power over the information networks, which news titles are shown in which kind of order. And that can then decide, like we will talk much more about it, uh, I will get uh, ahead of myself. And in this sense, the digital paradigm has been so fastly evolving that actually it, it rattled up even the normal progression of technological uh, innovations. So if we pull away the big curtain and in this exploration of the digital paradigm, we will follow more the traditional, well, the traditional also innovation theory, just because it's sometimes very confusing to think about deep learning, neural nets, transformers. For this, like, that can be quite confusing, uh, thinking, about, thinking about data and thinking about knowledge. So it's sometimes easier to think about more traditional technology and the fundamentals of innovation theory, of technological progress and societal change, they still stay the same. So understanding them and having a thorough understanding of innovation theory will help us to navigate the digital age a lot better because, well, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. So that's why it's important to, to study these concepts and, and the nature of technological revolution. So, okay, so if we go back to million years <laughs> to, to, to the Stone Age, we can see there has been some progress, right? There has been some progress even in the last few hundred years. I mean, this brain didn't, didn't develop uh, a lot over the last 200 years, but we would think ourselves more advanced than, for example, 200, 300, 400 years when, when our current countries um, were founded. And, and that goes all the way back. We can distinguish three big technological paradigms. In the first one, we started to learn how to dominate matter. That goes back to the Stone Age, the Homus habilis, when we started to distinguish ourselves from you know, the rest of, of the animals because we started to use tools. The Homus habilis, the handyman, started to, to use tools. And then the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and we started with that to work the land. So then we explored countries and it was very important to, to own land and, and, and to work matter. So, so that was the first period and that went for a very long time. Then came a period where we started to transform, learn how to transform energy. Well, first with the fire, the fire was a precursor. So we started that for a long time. So these waves, they actually start very slowly. And then came water with the mills, for example. Also then with ships, then steam was very important, electricity, and then the combustion engine. And, and I mean, we are still dealing with some of the outfalls of that revolution hundreds of years later. And now the third one, is we're learning how to transform information. So from transforming matter, energy, and information. And that is very cool. And also the information paradigm, we're already in the second 
technological long wave. These are called Schumpeterian long waves, and we will get into these. The first was we learned how to dominate uh, or understand to process data in communication. That's how it started with good old telephony, with telecommunication. And now the currently dominating paradigm has to do with knowledge and with algorithm, with artificial intelligence, with programming, and we will talk much more about that. That doesn't mean that each one of them is completely rolled out. They're also diffusing through society at different speeds and inevitably create divides and inequalities. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. What I wanted to show here is that the digital paradigm is so transversibly applicable that it even steals a little bit the thunder of some of the previous paradigms. So it means this here, um, in the transformation of knowledge, these are accumulative. So, okay, I, I show you one example. Let's take the example here of steam. I mean, it still creates, that, that created companies well, that explored in, in the United States, the, the Wild West connected the countries that are still, if you look at the largest transportation companies by market cap, yeah, the most of the top five are still uh, railway companies. I mean, that is very valuable to have all these, you know, railway tracks uh, across the country. That's how this country here was, was connected uh, and explored. And you can see here in the top five, four of them are still the ones who have this very valuable capital of, of railway tracks. One of them is United Parcel Service. That also goes like, you know, that's over 100 years back, which is very important also with the car. But check out who's on rank number six. There is a company that launched in 2011 and it snuck up on everybody else and is, is sneaking up there and is all over the world already. And actually this company is a transportation company that technically I don't think owns one transportation device. <laughs> it doesn't really, you know, own a car in that sense. It just, yeah, what does it own? It owns information and knowledge about the transportation sector. And with that, it kind of like leapfrogged. It leapfrogged from basically the steam age all the way to the knowledge and, and the algorithm age. How does it do that? Okay, let's look at this company. Uber, it's a transportation company that basically helps to coordinate the transportation sector. Now there are customers and there are drivers and there are, there are cars which can be used as, think about them as taxis and there are roads, but Uber not necessarily owns any of, of that. What it owns is information. It, connects inf it collects information about them and it creates a communication network between them. And then it creates what we will get to know as a digital twin. So basically it has a digital copy of you, if you ever use that service, same as the other digital companies in Silicon Valley have a little digital copy of you, a digital twin. Um, it knows your behavioral patterns, your desires and so forth. And the same of, let's say, the driver, the transportation, the taxi driver, and the same of the roads, which it not necessarily owns, or the taxis itself, which it not necessarily owns. And what it does then with that is, well, it creates a knowledge platform with or based on all these copies of these digital copies only, uh, data, just the data. And based on that, it does two things, machine learning. Machine learning works often with empirical data and it does computer simulations, which it does. Think about it, it's kind of like playing a video game, a video computer simulation. Think about just playing, uh, I don't know if you know SimCity or, or what kind of like planning game, reality game you like to, to play. And you know, you, you simulate things that not necessarily happen in reality, but then you use machine learning again, you try to optimize things and then you communicate downward again. And then you communicate your insights that you gain, your knowledge that you gain. Uh, downward again, and that is extremely valuable. So what's the value where this company lives is actually up here, and that doesn't work only for that company. That works also for, for other companies. So for example, yes, uh, there's you can do the same thing with music without actually owning uh, any music or with news without actually owning any news or with movies without necessarily owning movies. Now you can, if there's no competition and you know really what people want, you can start to produce your own content if nobody's up for the task of really providing what people want and you can start to produce your own songs. But not the original idea was actually not that. All these companies didn't really produce anything. Or here's a company which is, has more, like it doesn't have one hotel bed 
but it has more beds than all the other hotels. I don't know, the Sheraton and the Hinton and all of them, uh, Hilton and all of them combined, right? The Holiday Inn and so forth without actually owning a hotel bed. So what does this company, Airbnb and, and all of them actually own? Well, it owns information, data and knowledge of, well, the, call it the, the overnight sleeping hotel business or whatever whatever it is. It just coordinates that. It owns here. It owns this platform of knowledge where it does its machine learning, its computer simulation. And of course, this one here kicked all the other retailers out of the, without necessarily, I mean, again, if you don't have any competition, you might start to produce your own goods, like your own batteries and stuff, but not necessarily. You don't need to produce the books. You don't need to, it was, this Amazon was a book retailer at the beginning. It didn't own the books. It had Jeff Bezos had the knowledge of the book retail market. And with that, you know, killed all the competition. And that's what it is now, by far the world's biggest retailer. And, uh, but this is also like, I, I work with more traditional companies too. For example, the last few years, uh, I had the honor of working with a mining company. Mining companies, I mean, they are literally from the Stone Age. <laughs> and, you know, we humankind are very addicted to some of these natural resources that are extracted. So digital technology can really help us as well to make this a lot more efficient and a lot more environmentally friendly. So also these companies, it still creates value to own land and it still creates value to own a bed and to compose a song and it creates value to drive a car. But what the digital paradigm is about is the knowledge and the information that is created. And you can then, first of all, we call it digitalization. We digitalize information and data and communi communicate it upwards. And then we have algorithmification, which is then the knowledge that we produced up here that we then communicate down, let's say, to the, to the physical world. And, and, and both of them create value. And that basically, that was the previous paradigm, which is still ongoing. And many companies, many governments, many NGOs are still struggling with that, many social systems. And this is then the most advanced one. Go to that stage where, where we then, and we will talk a lot about uh, algorithmification in this course. So today we're gonna take a tour de force over the digital age and we'll always start the sessions with a little overview slide. And first of all, we have to talk about what role does technology play in social change in, in general. And then particularly soon in on zoom in on digital technology. So what actually is digital technology? What do we understand? And how can we think about the interplay of technology, society, and change. And then we will, in the last part, uh, we will do a quick overview of what this course, uh, this course, this, this specialization here will cover. And this course is offered in two ways. It is opened as a course at the University of California. It is at UC Online, available for all students of all 10 uh, campuses of the University of California. So from in Davis, that's where I am. There, there's Berkeley, there's UCLA, there's Santa Barbara. We always welcome many students, San Diego and so forth. I'm very happy to have you here. And this course is also as a specialization, actually. It's, it's cut up in several courses, open on the open internet as an open online course. So everybody, can take this material and I hope a lot of people join this discussion in order to get a better understanding of how to navigate and how to socially construct the digital age together. I'm very excited to go on this exploration together with you.